Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to hear Mr. Butler speak. I'm sure he needs no introduction beyond by saying, Paul, thank you for coming. Thank you for doing this talk for us. And we look forward to hearing you. So please, when he's finished, please make sure you show your appreciation properly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no, sorry, show your appreciation. Yeah. yeah. Um, title of the talk, uh, Managing Disease in the Fish Room, decided I'd give a talk on this. I actually changed plans. I was going to give a talk on something, something else, but decided I changed it at the last minute to this because recently there's been a lot of people posting on the forums where they're running into disease and they don't seem to have a plan or a method in place to manage what they're doing with it. Um, in the UK we are um, somewhat constrained as to what we can do and what we need to be able to do is to have a clear plan on how we actually manage the process so that we give ourselves and obviously the fish the best chance to actually get themselves better rather than us magically making them better. So, a little bit about me. I've kept fish for a long time. I uh, got my first fish, fish tank when I was eight years old. Um, <clears throat> for those that are any good at maths, that makes it about 48 years. Um, I'm not going to make this talk particularly scientific or technical um, because it's not the purpose of it. The purpose is to get an idea on how we manage the process. Not what dosages are, not what the treatments are, but just how we manage the process and how we go about dealing with it. It doesn't matter whether you've got one fish tank or 200 fish tanks. If you get a problem, you need a process to deal with it. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. Don't, don't be shy, just pipe up and ask away. Right, <clears throat> so it's the first thing most people do when they discover they've got a problem in the fish tank. Okay. Okay. You can shove something in here. <laughs> yeah? Usual reaction oh my god, what are we going to do? <laughs> so, what are we going to do? Well, there's medicine in, obviously. Anything will do. I don't care, and put some medicine in. Because it's got to be right, hasn't it? You're doing something. Anybody guess the next one? Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, if that's wrong, what should we be doing? Finding out what the problem is. To better understand the process, we actually need to understand what we mean by a disease, what we mean by a problem. If we are in the situation where we're trying to manage something, if we don't understand it, how can we manage it? <clears throat> to keep it fairly <coughs> simple, for the purposes of, of what we're talking about today, managing the disease is, is dealing with anything which will affect the fish and make the fish themselves unwell. Pathogens, bugs, critters, doesn't matter. As far as we're concerned, it affects the well-being, it's a disease. Again, to simplify it, we can look at diseases in a number of different ways. We could get very complicated and start talking about what they look like under microscopes. We won't. Um, but to categorise them and to help us to, to get a clear picture, we have two ways of looking at, at diseases. The first way is we have five groups of diseases. Anybody? Give me a clue. One of the groups. External parasites. Parasites, yeah. They're, they're actually the most common. They're the most common cause of, of illness in a fish tank is a parasite except for one other, which I'll come up to later. We've got bacteria, which clearly cause problems. Viruses, and again, we'll have a little word about those later. <coughs> and fungi. Um, the environment, water, air, 
is full of spores, fungal spores. And it's only when a fish is compromised that fungus can take hold. Anybody any idea what the last one is? Bad conditions. Bad conditions in the aquarium. Oh. Environmental. Hmm? Not strictly speaking a pathogen, but it has an impact on the fish. And so we can consider it a cause of disease. Because effectively that's what we're talking about here. These are the, the causes of disease. <coughs> the other way we look at, at um, diseases, pathogens, is how they actually affect the fish. Um, and the simplest way of, of doing that is to they either affect the fish on the outside or the inside. To use the technical term, an ectopathogen is a pathogen that affects the fish on the outside. It lives in the water, hard surfaces in the tank, on the fish's skin, the fish's gills, even in the fish's mouth. And there's some examples of the sorts of things that, that, that can affect our fish there. And most people will be uh, particularly <coughs> um, familiar with things like flukes and that. We've all heard of them. Um, and that. The next one, obviously, is the ones that live inside. The technical term for that is endopathogens. And again, you can see again that we have this similar types of pathogens that live inside as well as outside. And it's beginning to give us a clue as to how we have to manage this. The typical process of disease is something will cause the fish damage or harm on the outside. The fish then gets compromised. It then spreads from the outside to the inside of the fish. That's a fairly common process in fish disease. So what's the underlying root cause? Anybody guess what the most common cause of fish becoming ill is? Stress. Who said stress? Me. Spot on. Number one cause of illness in fish is stress. Um, do you know why because stress causes the problem? Yeah, because it lowers the immune response to the fish. Exactly. What happens is that when a, a fish becomes, when any animal becomes stressed, you get a peak and a trough in the immune response. You get an immediate sharp peak, and then it plummets. It actually go, goes off a cliff is the phrase they often use, and the immune system effectively shuts down. So for a brief period of time until the immune system can recover, the fish are incredibly vulnerable. So stress is the number one cause of the immune system shutting down, and therefore it's the number one cause of disease and illness. How many of us bought new fish and thrown it straight in the tank? Come on, let's be honest. Yeah. Eh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and you know, for years, I got away with it. And I'm sure many of you have done it and got away with it. And you read it all the time. Oh, why should I quarantine fish? Surely they all got the same books. Surely this, surely that. Yeah, well, there's plenty out here. It's got to be right, hasn't it? Absolutely. There's, there's got to be, there'll be people in here who have done it and have got burned and have lost fish because of it. I have. Okay, so we've been good. We've bought new fish, we've put them in a separate tank. We still get a problem. Yeah, this is a husbandry issue. This is us causing the problem because what we haven't done is make sure we've managed it properly. Hmm? Barrier nursing. Uh, in, in a way. One way of looking at it. Food. Seems an odd one to put up for a cause of disease. Low food. Hmm? Low food. Hmm. Certain live freshwater foods are not clean. It's the kindest way of putting it. Um, unless they are farmed 
in, in, in clean run water, then foods like tube effects and bloodworm live in polluted, uh, foul, horrible water. And if ever you look at, if you take one and look at it under the microscope, you can actually see parasites living inside the, the, the bloodworm or the tube effects. Um, it's quite revealing when you actually do that. Uh, and th there's no debate that if you feed this type of food to fish, if their immune system is compromised, then there's a risk that you will introduce a problem to that fish. Also, these worms also bring in uh, contaminants such as heavy metals and that, because as they go through the silt, the, the worms <coughs> absorb these. And the fish obviously eating them then take these heavy metals into the system. And one of the reasons why heavy metals are a problem to fish is that they have no mechanism for getting rid of the heavy metals. So once they're in the fish, they're there. So it, it can take a long time to build up to levels such that start to actually cause a problem, you know, to toxic levels and that. But many heavy metals, mercury, lead, fish can't get rid of them. We can't get rid of them. Or uh, organophosphates. Uh, yeah, um, they're less likely to affect um, tube effects and, and uh, bloodworm. They're more likely to kill tube effects and bloodworm uh, because they are. Um, uh, th that's that's their role. In, an organophosphate is, is an antiparasitic <coughs> in its own right. Uh, they're actually illegal in this country. Uh, yeah, I think they're illegal in Europe, uh, but they're certainly illegal in this country. Other external sources. What do we mean by that? Anybody? Vibration, lights, cleaning lady with uh, with a hoover, or uh, painters and decorators with spirits. And there's there's a coffee on the top of the tank and letting it spill. Yeah, yeah there's that. Um, <laughs> it, and you know, there's you know, one thing I did was, was I was doing some routine testing on the tanks, and I'd done all the tests and I got them all lined up checked all the colours and then tipped all the uh, contents into the tank for some mm -hmm. bizarre reason. <laughs> we, you know, we all have our moments. <laughs> but seriously, th there's, there's things going on in and around the environment that can affect it. Um, a few years ago on the American Forum, there was a, a person there who had these really weird problems happening in the system. We'd, we'd gone through a process of eliminating everything, and the only thing that was left was something in the environment. And they were adamant it couldn't be, but we'd actually gone through it piece by piece, and in the end, what was happening is, in the, in the States they have these um, like air conditioning units in houses, and they've got a pipework running where the tank was, and there was a tiny leak, mm -hmm. and it was dripping into the tank. And they found it by accident. So they fixed the leak, fixed the problem. <coughs> right, <coughs> treating pathogens. Because once we've identified we've got that, what are we going to do? <coughs> well, pathogens that live on the outside of the animals can be treated in a variety <coughs> of ways. Most common is using some form of chemical treatment, and there's lots of these treatments out there. They all have, they all have the strengths and they all have the weaknesses. They're just some examples of the commonly available ones that we would use as a hobbyist. Um, and the chemicals work simply by oxidizing. Um, they effectively burn the parasites. Um, they also uh, can work in a way where they actually interrupt the way that the parasites grow, so they affect the, at the cell level as well, in some cases. I did say it wasn't yet too technical. We can also treat some external parasites uh, with certain drugs. Uh, flukes, for example, can be treated with a, a worming treatment. Um, it's, it, 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 they're, they're susceptible to it. So 
Products like uh, flubendazole, prasinquantel, can be used to treat flukes and a variety of other worm-based external parasites. Some external pathogens um, are better treated with antibiotics. Uh, typical example of that would be columnaris. It's actually a bacterial infection. Internal pathogens, really, we can only treat them with drugs if we're going to treat them. Different types of drugs from antibiotics to um, what are called helmets and things like that, anti-helmets. <coughs> but basically, most of these drugs will be familiar to, to many people. Um, but again, this is the decisions we're facing and this is why we need to understand how the, the animal is affected. Because it, if it's affected externally and we treat it internally, we get it wrong. If it's affected internally and we treat it externally, we'll also get it wrong. Treating viruses. Anybody know how we treat viruses? You went the <laughs> yeah. We can't, basically. We can't treat viruses. Um, I don't know how many recently been to the doctor saying I'm not feeling very well and he said you've got a virus go away mm. or take an anodin <coughs> or something like that but essentially it's all we can do we don't actually give the fish an anodin well I don't <laughs> what we can do is we can create an environment for the fish to give it a better chance of recovery um, some of the things that you can do to help the fish, specifically discus I'm talking here, because you wouldn't want to lower pH specifically with, for example, tanganinos. Mm. That really wouldn't be creating a stress-free environment for them. So you reduce anything that causes them stress. With discus, you lower the pH, and if, if needed, you provide some form of supportive medication. Now we'll touch on supportive medication a bit later. <coughs> How long can you lower it then? How? How long can you lower it to? Um, because some people have them at seven, some people at six. I know. All, all, I, all I'll say at the moment is watch this space and we'll come back to that, I Long promise. Long you've got. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 we will come back to that. Treating fungi. I alluded to this earlier. Um, when a fish gets infected with a, with a fungal infection, it's usually a secondary. In fact, I would say 99.99% of the time, it's a secondary. It's really quite important that you work out what the primary cause is and make sure that that's resolved. If the primary cause is the fact that the fish has been, is living in, in, a, in a dirty aquarium and there's inappropriate tank mates in there or sharp edges or that type of thing where the, the, the animal can injure itself, <clears throat> then there's no point treating the fungus until you can create a better environment for it. Because as soon as you treat it, it'll come back. And <clears throat> you may have noticed when we went through the list of ecto and endo that the fungi was listed on both of them. Well, technically speaking, when a fungus, when a, something like saprolegina affects a fish, it attaches to the surface and it sends roots down into the fish's flesh. And quite often, <coughs> those roots have penetrated quite deeply before the, sport, the stems of the actual fungus appear on the outside. So the fish has been infected, usually for a day or two, before we see it. And it can be quite serious. Fairly easy to deal with though. Many of the chemical treatments will deal with fungus, as will changing the water. Yeah, treating environmental factors. This is a good one. <clears throat> they live in water. If the water's polluted, change it. Most people seem to be reluctant at the first sign of disease to change water. If 
we go back to the beginning of the, the <coughs> excuse me, the, the presentation, where people rush into Medicaid. If they rushed to change water first, they would be doing something productive. <coughs> if you are running a 150 gallon tank, um, and you can only produce 50 gallons of clean water, changing water may not be an option. <coughs> so, <coughs> using carbon in these circumstances is an option. Again, there's, there's a, a lot of debate on, on discus forum around the world about the use of carbon in discus tanks. The main reason not to use carbon in discus tanks is because you're wasting money. Because we change so much water, there's no point for using carbon. But if you're in a situation where you have a pollutant in the tank and you cannot produce enough clean water to change all of it, then you have to use something to remove the pollutants. And there's nothing better than activated carbon. It's simple to use, it's not overly expensive, and it works. If the environmental factors are because it's in a busy hallway with loose floorboards and you get the 915 Express from Waterloo every morning thundering by, then perhaps relocating the tank might be the option. Um, certain types of vibration, um, certain types of reflections and that cause a lot of stress to discus. Um, if you want to see a good reaction, a, a flight reaction from a, a wild caught discus for example is get a, a, shiny, a light shining into the tank then move your hand across the light mm -hmm. and they will dive if they don't they're not healthy because it's a natural reaction they think there's a bird coming to get them so it causes stress again we, we'll, we'll see this a few times providing support meds if needed and as I said before, we will be talking about types of support medication. We briefly mentioned antibiotics. There's been, I know there's been lots of internet chatter on the, on the UK based forums about antibiotics. Uh, I also know that, should we say, there's a, a certain amount of trading going on. At least do it with your eyes open and understand the situation. It's vet prescription only in the UK. Our colleagues from Europe, America, and that are much better off in terms of availability of drugs than we are, because they can go into various outlets and buy them. We can't. Buy them France. Sorry? Buy them the counter in the chemistry. Yeah, yeah. France, Spain, Belgium. Um, I, I know for a fact that you can, you can buy antibiotics over the counter. Um, it's actually covered by a law, very boring, um, but that's the actual current law that, that covers this. And just to be absolutely clear, it is a criminal offence, not a civil offence. It's a criminal offence to own or use any prescription only medicine without it being prescribed. also a criminal offence to be a drug dealer. <laughs> In essence, it's the same law. Right, so, what should we do when we get a disease outbreak? Getting back to it. Yeah, let's, don't panic, that's the first thing. Evaluate and assess. Well, let's look at the situation, work out what we've got. Eliminate the obvious. Well, is, is the heater plugged in? <laughs> yeah. Did I switch the filter back on? If necessary, systematically <coughs> gather the evidence of what the fish look like, the symptoms, how it's behaving. Confirm the diagnosis if necessary. 
determine what other treatments, execute the treatments. One of the steps. And this is one most people don't make sure that the treatments work. Yeah, it's reevaluate, assess what's going on. So, why don't we panic? Clouds our judgment. We'll act in haste. We've all, all done it at some stage with fish. Well, most of us anyway. I have. You will make errors, and you can actually make the situation much, much worse. Oh, my fish is ill, it's stressed. I'm going to throw some chemical into the tank, which makes its environment much, much worse. Creates more stress. What do we mean by evaluate and assess? Is it one fish, all the fish? Now, have we got a small problem, big problem? Are other fish behaving differently? How does the actual tank itself look? Is has the water suddenly gone purple? Eliminating the obvious seems pretty common sense to all of us, and yet most of us will be guilty of not doing it. And we're, we're, I can speak for myself certainly, and a number of people I know, we are definitely guilty of not eliminating the obvious. <clears throat> are the temperatures okay? You know, did we forget to put the heaters back on? Then the water change, pull that on, plug the heater, yeah. plug it back in. You know, has the heater stuck on? <clears throat> are the filters working? Do we know the working? Have we confirmed the working? You know, we've not just assumed the working, because why wouldn't it be? Is the equipment operating as it should be? Are we getting proper water flow? We're not getting dead spots, for example. When we did the last water change and forgot to unplug the heater, did it crack? You know? Have we introduced fish, or have a, a, other fish in the tank suddenly started to change their behaviour because Perhaps the breeding. Um, I don't know if you've ever kept rams with your discus, but if ever you've seen a tiny pair of rams when they're breeding, backing up six and seven inch discus, it's quite impressive to watch. But that's what happens. Is it the pH appropriate? Now I use the word appropriate deliberately there, because what's appropriate for me and my discus might not be for yours. If your discus have been used to living in a pH of 6, and suddenly it's 8, then that will cause some stress. So, it, it's, <clears throat> you know, an obvious water quality issues. Is, is the water clean? Is it cloudy? Full of algae or anything like that? The, the usual. Most of this speaks for itself. But I believe in having, if you, if you are in a situation where you have gone past all the obvious, and you have got sick fish, you need to systematically assess what the symptoms of the fish are. Particularly important if you're seeking advice without somebody visiting to see the animal. In other words, <coughs> posting up in the disease section on, on, on Bidker or similar. There is that handy little thing where Slacky normally posts me. Mm. That is like a questions and answer session. I sure. always, whenever I get a problem, I always look at that because it reminds me what to look for. Yeah, and, and there's, there's good reason why we put things like, like those questionnaires together. It, it's, it's perfectly understandable that the, the people with the, with the poorly fish want an answer quickly. They want somebody to say, do this and your fish will be better. And some people get very, very attached to the fish. <coughs> I know many members of Bidka, for example, name the fish. Well, you know, I'll tell you now, my daughters name the fish. All of my fish have a name. I don't give them names, but my daughter names them. 
And I'm sure that when my granddaughter's old enough, she'll name them as well. And heaven forbid if I get rid of one that she likes. But, but people get attached, emotionally attached to them. They consider them pets. And they're sick. And what they want is an immediate answer. Please make my fish better. There's a lot of experienced people on the various forums who will happily help you get your fish better. But you have to help them. And the best way of doing that is to go through formalised procedure, gather the evidence. Take your time, write it down. If you can, photograph it. If you can, perhaps a video. They all help people looking at it to come to a, a, a symptomatic evaluation of what's going on. But do make sure also that you've gone through the eliminate the obvious stage first. The problem that I found, Paul, is that that people are unwilling to do that, that you, you get some people out there that are very proud yes. and, and unwilling to admit that they don't know. Absolutely. And rather than seek advice and lose face, they yeah. carry on with the problem. Uh, and and it's getting people to, 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 to admit that they don't know and seek advice. And never a true word said either because I mean I'm assuming everybody in here keeps discus. Uh, and anybody in here had discus for a year or more? Most of us? Anybody in here never lost a discus? Really? A minute. I've been given for a year though. Ah, well. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> but that's fine. Go into it with eyes open. I've had serious infections in my fish house very serious infections in my fish house to the point where I had to seek veterinary help because I couldn't fix it now I'm supposed to know what I'm doing allegedly so the, the message in that is if the alleged best I don't like using that phrase get problems anybody can mm. So, you're absolutely right. Swallow your pride. If you don't know, it doesn't make you a poor discus mm -hmm. keeper. It just means you don't know. <laughs> Confirm the diagnosis. Really, carrying on from the, the points I made about, in my case, having <clears throat> to seek professional help to sort the fish out. In the particular case with, with me, I had to take three live animals up to a veterinary surgery in Andover for them to do various tests on. And the first thing they did with them was obviously kill the fish um, because you no point taking dead animals up. Um, in, in my case, I had a system-wide outbreak of a bacterial infection and I had somewhere in the region of 110 adult discus that I was at risk of losing. So sacrificing three discus was quite easy. <coughs> even, even if two of them were wild. <coughs> so, if you know how to use a microscope and you have one, use the microscope. If necessary, seek a second opinion. Um, if you've got good hobbyists around you in the local area, Drop them a note, get them around to have a look. Having a second set of eyes can help, even if it's just as a sounding board to go through the, have you checked this, have you done that? Use a <coughs> reference source. Reference sources are things like Edward Noga's book, which is a, it's the, it's the reference source that most vets use. And it explains what the diseases are, what the various treatments are, and how to treat them. It also explains how to diagnose them. It's an expensive book, but it's a professional work, heavy duty. Um, there's other good books, Discus Health by Untergasser. Um, Andrew So actually has uh, a good book, Disease and Problems and Solutions it's called, isn't it? 
okay. after his book. Um, these can be considered reference books because these guys, I know Andrew, and I know that he has killed thousands of discus deliberately to look at them under microscopes because that's what he's like. But he has learned from it. And he had the farm, so he could do it. And like I say, if at the end of the day, the forum can't help, your friends, your colleagues, your peers can't help, find a vet. Some of them are very, very good. But I have to travel a little way to find one. You might have to. Um, you might have to. I'm very fortunate uh, where I live. Um, in Winchester, I've got Peter Scott, um, who, for those that don't know, is probably the most He's one of the television vets, um, but he specialises in um, aquatic and exotic creatures. Um, and I'm also uh, a decent working relationship with a lady called Fiona MacDonald. Um, she produces some medicines which we can buy over the counter, but she's also a vet, a fish vet. And with one, one issue that I had uh, with some fish, it was leading us to, to, to believe that we had um, a particular situation going on, so we sought Peter Scott's advice. And he said, if it is, he'll publish it, because it'll be the first time ever. So I felt quite relieved it wasn't. Um, once we, we've, did I miss a slide there? No, no. Right. So we've confirmed the treatment, we've used our reference sources, vets, whatever. We're now going to treat. It's decision time. What are we going to treat with? Chemicals, medicines, antibiotics. I separate medicines and antibiotics out to keep a clear line between the two. By medicines, I'm talking about over-the-counter medicines like Fluxol um, and such. Antibiotics are what they are, antibiotics, prescription only. Mentioned support treatments a lot earlier. Typically, these, this tends to be salt, an Epsom salt. What I was going to do was have a pot of each, because people seem to get confused. But I let them taste them, but I figured maybe it maybe wasn't the best idea. Temperature requirements and filtration requirements. Now, why? Why would I put that under determining treatments? Because you can raise the temperature to help. Sometimes, in some circumstances, yeah. Um, you can also lower the temperature to help. It goes both ways. And filtration. Why is that something we consider when we're determining treatment? Because if you use antibiotics, it's going to kill the filtration. Yeah. Absolutely. If you use a strong chemical like chloramine tea, or you've got an immature filter and you use a strong dose of potassium permanganate, for example, it'll kill your filter. And you'll work on, you'll carry on in the belief that your filter's working. Execute the treatment. I couldn't think of a better way of describing this. Um, many people don't follow a disciplined enough approach when they're actually treating fish. I'll just throw some in. Oh, well, I did it yesterday. It'll be all right if I don't do it today. And, and so on and so forth. Understand what the dosage is. Because we had um, a case last year, I think it was, where one of our members treated with potassium permanganate, got his maths wrong. Um, and I think, if memory serves, he lost fish. So understand the dosage. And if in doubt, if you don't trust your maths, stick it up on the forum, somebody will. Somebody will get it right. How often? Dosage frequency. Mm -hmm. 
don't overdose or underdose, particularly with antibiotics. Um, with caustic chemicals, overdose will cause immediate physical damage to the fish. Um, with antibiotics, it can literally overwhelm their internal organs. If you underdose, for example, with a, with, uh, a chemical such as potassium permanganate or chloramine T, it'll have no effect. So you're just wasting time. If you underdose with antibiotics, you're giving the pathogens an opportunity to adapt to the antibiotics. So the antibiotics themselves become useless. Understand for how long you need to treat. And the reason that's there is that if you've correctly diagnosed and you've got a case of flukes, then if it's the egg laying fluke, you need to treat for much, much longer than if it's the life bearing fluke. There's two types of fluke, gill fluke, skin fluke. Gill fluke's egg laying. And you need to break the cycle. You will not affect a fluke egg with chemical treatment. Not, and leave the fish alive anyway. So you need to wait until the eggs are hatched. And you need to break that cycle. So you need to treat longer, for example. If it's a skin fluke or costier, something like that, you can treat for much shorter periods of time. If it's an antibiotic, you need to treat long enough for the antibiotic to get into the system and do its job. And another common question is, where am I going to treat? Do I treat the main tank or do I put them in a hospital tank? And there's arguments both ways. There's arguments both ways. There is no one right or wrong way. It speaks for itself. Am I using the right treatment? Is it working? Is it causing any other problems? So, I mean, some of the problems can be that you, you've so badly affected the water quality that the fish can no longer breathe, so they're all coming up to the surface. Um, particularly common if you're using antibiotics, for example. Oxytet. Oxytet's a, a, a known one that can cause problems, yeah. We can't save them all of the time. Sometimes it's just not meant to be. Um, sometimes we'll get a diagnosis wrong. <coughs> sometimes it's too late. Sometimes they were going to die anyway. Um, we, we seem to, <coughs> over the years, we seem to have developed the belief that everything should live its full potential life, when in nature that's not the case. Um, so don't kill yourselves if you lose a fish. It's one of those things, it will happen. Just accept the fact, learn from it and move on. <clears throat> right, what I'm going to do now is talk through some of the points that were raised and that supporting treatments, microscopes, a few other bits and pieces, pH, temperature, and try and get a bit of debate going. And that. I mentioned microscopes before, and I've read many times on the forum, they're too expensive, don't know how to use one. What points are they? Anybody own a microscope? Yeah, is it your house? Yeah. <laughs> I've also got a binocular one on the way. <laughs> Smart ass. <laughs> I know who I am. Anybody know how to use a microscope? Yeah. Anybody been formally trained in using a microscope? Because I was a bad nurse. If this was a koi show, the numbers would have been reversed. Hmm. And I said to a group of koi keepers, anybody used a mic uh, microscope, all hands would have gone up.
to me that, that tells me something. Either it tells me that the koi keepers don't know how to look after fish and they've got disease all the time, so they shouldn't keep carp, or perhaps we haven't caught up with them yet. Admittedly, koi can be a lot more expensive than discus. But discus are a big fish. They're easy to handle. They're easy to take samples from. What's the benefit of using a microscope? Anybody? Diagnosis. Sorry? Diagnosis. Diagnosis. Fine. So we've got a situation where we absolutely believe our fish have got flukes. We take a scraping from the appropriate places, stick it under the microscope, and we don't see anything. What's it told us? Not Sorry? We haven't got flukes. So even if we don't see something, we're learning something. We're absolutely confirming the diagnosis. You can probably tell I'm a great believer in using microscopes. <coughs> but you do need to develop the skills. If you ever get the chance to go in a wet shop, it's called go one. Can be expensive. Well, they can be, yeah. Um, but so can losing your fish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a, a simple Brunel monocular microscope is the cost of one adult discus. Not that expensive. All right. The top end Nikon binocular uh, microscope is expensive. Paul, up to what magnification should you be looking for in a microscope? For it doesn't, doesn't have to be that much. Is it? Um, for general day to day use, um, a magnification of up to about 400 is fine. Um, after that, you start to see things at the cellular level. Um, and you will see all sorts of, of things going on. And unless you are specifically looking for bacteria, you've no real need to go much above that. You will see costier, ick. Um, oh, you see flukes at 100. Um, Colnaris, even. You, you'll be able to see most. Flagellates? Uh, Yes, you'll see, see flatulates. You may have to stain to see some flatulates, but you'll see most protozoa, um, if not all. You certainly see, well, yeah, you certainly see. I mean, some worms you see with a naked eye. Uh, some worms you can see the evidence with a, mag with a magnifying glass. Um, but if you have a microscope that has a uh, fourfold, tenfold, and fortyfold um, objective, on it, or, or a combination that gives you that, or similar, then that will be, that's more than enough for, for what we need in a fish room. You know, they don't need to be oil immersed, high powered electron microscopes, as much as we might like to play with them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, up to 400 times. Um, some, I've seen some microscopes that, that go in less common gradations. Uh, but typically they go for 10, 400, you know, so four times, which is you know, 40 times mag, uh, which is where you should, you should always start at the lowest magnification and do an assessment of the whole slide um, and work methodically. Um, supported medication, salt. I have seen people recommending that discus are kept in salted water. I've seen people saying that salt doesn't work. I've seen posts on forums saying, don't use salt with iodine in it. Um, don't use salt with anti-caking agents in it. Put some salt in, it's called Epsom salts, get it from the chemist. There's a lot of, um, want a better phrase, Tosh talked about salt in aquariums. Again, I stress aquariums. Salt is both a medicine and a supportive agent. 
Um, you can use it on its own or with other medications. Many people have seen recommendations from me to use salt and acroflavin together, for example. Um, you can use it as a long-term bath or a short-term dip. It's used in different ways when you do that, but you can use it that way. Some general guidelines on is don't exceed three parts per million for long-term bass with discus. It will cause them to have problems internally. Um, people clear on what a long-term bath is. Understand that we're talking here days and days rather than 20 minutes in a bucket. Salt won't affect your pH. It's pH neutral. Um, it has no impact on it because the ionic nature of it is, is, is balanced. Um, it will affect your TDS. So if, you, if you've got a, T, a conductivity pen or a TDS meter and you put salt in your tank and you stick it in, it'll go off the scale. Um, for use in an aquarium, you can use any salt. Iodized salt is safe because the iodine is iodized. It's in a safe format cannot cause any harm. It's safe with the anti-caking agents. YPS stands for yellow prussiate of soda. Of, of soda. It's actually cyanoferronide. Um, but if you are going to use salt with anti-caking agents, don't do it in the midday sun in Texas because that's strong enough to break the salt down. Because of that, I'd suggest you don't use UVs as well with salt. Salt isn't plant safe. There are some plants which are a little bit more tolerant to salt, but most plants don't like salt. Why is that important? Because if you start killing your plants, you start affecting your water quality. As a general guide, if you've got a fish with an open wound, put some salt in the water. up to three parts per million if you need to. I might as well talk about Epsom salt because that's the other one that people often talk about. <coughs> it's a medicine in its own right. In actual fact, there's some research papers out there now uh, that's showing that uh, high doses of Epsom salt is effective against flagellates on its own. Um, not been in a situation where I can test this for myself, thank God. Um, but there's, there's a number of published papers now which is suggesting that this is a treatment in its own right for flagellate, which I think is quite good uh, because it's cheap enough and it's available over the counter. Um, I've often, when people are using an antibiotic like metronidazole, I've often <coughs> recommended to use Epsom salts in conjunction with because when I've used that combination, it's been far more effective. It will affect the pH of the tank, particularly if you've got soft water. Um, it will tend to make the pH of the water around about 6.8. And it will obviously increase TDS. Anybody who keeps planted tanks will know that putting magnesium sulfate into your tank is perfectly safe with plants. We're happy with that so far. How many people have a dedicated hospital tank? <coughs> Good. My hospital tanks are completely bare tanks. They have glass covers on them. I have two or three heaters put to one side and two or three air stones. I actually use the um, yellow, red and green plastic air stones um, that you get from Malaysia. They're easy to sterilise. Yes. Um, you can stick them in bleach and get them clean. Um, I never use filtration in a hospital tank. Um, because there's no need, because I'm going to do 100% water changes on it every day. 
Um, now, not everybody can do that, so we have you have decisions to make. We talked about temperatures before. This is some of the things which happen when you change temperatures in a fish tank. And a lot of these are measurable um, with relatively inexpensive test kits or equipment. If you increase the temperature, you reduce the dissolved oxygen. Now, from memory, typical dissolved oxygen levels are 28 degrees, about eight parts, I think it is. Ray might be able to help me on this one. It's, it's higher, is it? But for every two degrees, you drop apart something like that. I can't remember the exact numbers, it doesn't matter, the principle's the same. When you increase the temperature of water, its ability to hold oxygen reduces. If you then use a, a chemical or an antibiotic in that, they also starve the water of oxygen. So if you've increased the temperature and used a chemical, you can really reduce O2. Now, I'm not saying don't do it. What I'm saying is be aware of it. Because there's times when that's exactly what we want to do, is increase the temperature. <clears throat> be aware also that as you increase the temperature, bacterial bacteria grow faster. And they will grow faster and the discus immune system can spill up significantly faster. Um, I have seen people put a sick fish into a 50 litre tank with the temperature cranked up to 34 degrees. Two hours later, the water's milky. Bacteria. It's not slime coming off the fish, it's a bacterial bloom in the water. Mostly those fish are lost. So be aware of it. Understand the risks of doing it. Needless to say, high temperatures can increase the rate at which parasites reproduce. This can actually be a good thing, as crazy as it sounds, because it shortens the treatment cycle, which means you're exposing the fish to harmful chemicals for shorter periods of time. There's anecdotal evidence, and lots of it, that higher temperatures kill some parasites. Um, there's a belief that high temperatures kill flagellates. According to various scientific papers from Florida University, this is true. At 39 degrees Celsius, flagellates are indeed killed. Very good chance, isn't it? And you have to keep them at that temperature long enough for the internal organs of the fish to get up to that temperature. Dodgy, my book. Um, you want chips? Hmm? You want with chips? Yeah. Um, some parasites like um, like good old fashioned white spot. The belief is that high temperatures kill white spot. And in some ways, I think that's right. Um, although, reports from Scandinavia, and I think Poland now, are suggesting that there's some temperature resistant strains of white spot. Which, if, that's, if that is true, um, a bit of a <coughs> Long term exposure to high temperatures causes stress to discuss. Not speculation, it's fact. Um, many people keep the discus at 30 degrees Celsius. Um, personally, I think that's too high. But raising the temperature for a few days, a week, maybe even 10 days, can help boost the fish's immune system. You can get an immune response from it. Um, and so the short-term stress, if you like, of, of 
going out on a warm sunny day to the long term benefit of your immune system spilling up is a, is a trade off worth doing. And the message really with temperatures is that if you are intending to raise the temperature, remember that everything will happen faster. And that is, includes the bacteria growing stronger, parasites growing faster, water quality going off quicker. It's sometimes it's a good thing to do, raising the temperature. But people don't fully understand the risks they don't appreciate why. Well, I did as, as you know, everybody says raise the temperature to 33 degrees. Norman Fisher at the top of the water. pH. The gentleman over there asked about pH before. It's, it's derived from the Latin, which um, means weight of hydrogen. Um, interesting subject is pH. Probably one people have lots of discussion about many times. A high pH, um, as most people know, will make ammonia more toxic if it's present. What most people don't realise is that a low pH will increase the toxic toxicity of nitrites. So it's a bit of a got you both ways, isn't it? Because the commonly held advice is Oh, don't worry about your ammonia because your pH is 6.5. Well, we've all heard it. We've, probably most of us have written it at some stage. But where there's ammonia, oftentimes, nitrites <coughs> following. But that's why um, salt supportive therapy is It is. There's a salt blocks up the nitrite. Well, the way salt works is... <coughs> If you've got nitrites in your system, one of the reasons why you'll put salt in is that the chloride ion outcompetes the nitrite ion on the haemoglobin to carry oxygen. So it prevents the nitrite from blocking the oxygen carrying capacity of the haemoglobin. That's the red blood cells which take oxygen around. And that's why you put salt in. Low pH can suppress bacterial activity. Um, many of the uh, Asian discus keepers years ago used to treat fish by sticking them in a fish tank with catapa leaves, which is like the pH form. Um, low pH can help support the fish if they have a viral infection. Gradual changes in pH to discus utterly harmless. If, you're, if in the morning your pH is 7, and at tea time it's 5.5, don't worry. Don't worry, not a problem. Rapid changes are dangerous, no debate, particularly high to low. If you have a bigger change of one degree pH going down in a few minutes, that will cause discus stress. I can't remember the exact number, I couldn't find it because I was looking. I think it's, if it's greater than a 3 pH swing downwards in the space of 15 minutes, it can cause the discus to have far more serious problems and can kill. And despite what many people believe, a real pH crash is extraordinarily rare. That's where pH crashes, where it will go from, say, 6 to, th to 3 or 2 in 5 minutes, 10 minutes. That's a crash. It takes 6 hours to go down there. That's just going down slowly. That's filter working well. <laughs> Usually. Often it is. It's soft water with, a good, with an effective filter or some other treatment in there. And contrary to popular belief, Nitrifying bacteria can and do live at low pHs. There might be different variants of them, but they do live there. They must live there. The next slide I'm going to put up after this one, the photograph I took when I had my system running. I can assure you there was zero ammonia. 
technically, I suspect if I'd have used a HANA test kit, it might have shown 0 0.01 ammonia. Um, but then that's present in just about everything. The zero nitrites. <coughs> One of the interesting side effects, although I can't say that that was down to pH, was that I had very low nitrates. And when I say I was heavily stocked, I had on the system around about 3,000 litres of water, and I had somewhere in the region of 120 adult discus, plus breeding pairs, plus fry. Honestly, this is not a, a setup, it's not a fixed thing, it's not a trick. And I can assure you, the meter was properly calibrated. If you can't read it, that says 3.76. And there's a few people in this room who visited my fish room enough times to know that I'm absolutely telling the truth on that one. Now, don't go away thinking, I've got to get my pH down to 3.76, <laughs> right? That's not the purpose of this. This is to show you that if, you, if that's where your system and your water management routine takes your pH, don't stress about it. Don't worry about it. Just let it be. And Martin and Barry for certain saw the, my fish and that. They looked all right to me. Oh, to me. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to pick some shit. Yeah. So, you've got to bear in mind that discus are evolved to live in very low mineral content water and are evolved to deal with pH swings. Because in the natural environment, the pH can swing by as much as one and a half points in a day. So it's natural for a discus to have a pH swing. It's not as stressful. And yes, some of the rivers are very low. Like I say, though, that isn't suggesting you keep your discus in that. Aye. <laughs> Whatever your pH is will generally be fine. Did it stay at that or did it go back up? Um, generally, generally, if I plotted the graph of, of the pH, um, what, what you would see is very small peaks when I did a water change and then you'd see a series of smaller peaks during things like when shortly after feeding for example um, you'd see a, a change in pH when the lights came on um, when the pH would start to go down a little bit um, go down or go up, go up a little bit beg your pardon <laughs> and what I believe that was down to is overnight, because the discus weren't all particularly active, I believe that the CO2 levels in the water naturally came up a little bit, dropped it a little lower. And once they started to swim around and cause, because they'd be competing for food, and you know, I'd be banging and crashing about there and sometimes making them jump and obviously cleaning tanks and that, you tend to gas a bit off. But you'd put food or, or um, you know, granular food or, or beef hearts or whatever in the tank and that would have a small change particularly on my system I ran very very soft water um, you'll see less of a change on, uh, on, on harder water naturally because it's more <coughs> um, I had a, 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 a 200 litre sump with 150 litres of, of filter media in it so that's quite a lot. It's a really dense bed of filter media. So I don't think, I mean, I could have probably have put six parts per million, ten parts per million potassium manganate in, and the, back, the filter bacteria would have gone, yeah, get on with it. Um, but it was, the filter was five years old. You know, I mean, it was, we're talking bulletproof. So it's clearly going to produce a lot more nitric acid at the end of the process quicker than one that isn't quite so, so strong. When I first started the system, um, the, the pH settled down in the, in the high fours, low fives. Over a period of, of several years, it got down to that number. But I never worried about it. 
because I looked at the fish and they were happy. And I thought, fine, they're not worried. No. Yeah, I mean, it, it's people do get worried about pH. Um, but there's, there's no, no it's real... It's having the confidence, isn't it? To, yeah. To trust what you've yeah. done. Yes, it is very much so. Mm -hmm. That's knowledge. Um, yeah. Knowledge and experience. It comes with, yeah, it comes with doing it. Because um, I rang him up when mum went like it, and he said, <laughs> 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 he laughed at me. Yeah, well, I'm like that. Oh, <laughs> lots of support and help. <laughs> right, my favourite subject when fish keeping is concerned, water. As far as I'm concerned, it's either clean or it isn't. No in between. You cannot overdose on clean water. And really, if, if you take one message away, today, take that one away, because if you've got problems in the fish room, change some water. Because at least it reduces some contributing factors. Yeah. Clean water is more important than the pH of your water or the TDS of your water. I see people say, yes, but my water is 7.5. <coughs> I don't care. Is it clean? If it's clean, get it in the tank. Clean water has to be our first line of defence. If you change water, you are removing pathogens because they live in the water. If you take the water out, put fresh water in, you've taken those pathogens away. You're creating a better environment for the fish. To reiterate it, if you're in doubt, do a water change. If you want to do something, you feel you've got to treat your fish, do a water change. Cleanest water for hobbyists is produced by an RO system. When you remineralize with either commercial or homemade remineralizing salt. The next cleanest water is produced by an HMA system. For those that don't know, HMA stands for heavy metal axe, and it was a term originally coined by Mark Evenden. Um, so it, in, in many ways you could say Mark lays claim to the, the trademark for a better phrase, um, but it isn't a trademark as such. Um, the next cleanest water comes from using some form of chemical conditioner, be that prime, aquasafe or, or whatever. Now, I actually rate that a lot lower down than the first two, because with these chemical conditioners you're not removing things from the water, you're changing the form of these things in the water. And that I'm absolutely confident in that last statement that 90% of fish keepers will improve the health of the fish by using HMA. Because HMA removes heavy metals, chlorine, chloramine, loads of other crud, and produces clean water. It still may have nitrates and phosphates in it, it doesn't remove those. That's why our own produces cleaner water. But if you are keeping discus and your water is decent quality out of the tap, or if you're blessed like some of our Scottish friends are, with a, a TDS of 40 out of the tap and naturally soft water, just use Nature Rain. Because it allows you to change water and get clean water. Anybody who got any questions or anything? <clears throat> or want to challenge me on any? Well, honestly, you can't go wrong with clean water. I know I say this a lot on the forums, but if in doubt, change water. Well, when you, when you I, say I change water, you know, what percentage are you talking of the water change? Yeah. If, you're dealing, if you're dealing with a, a disease scenario, as much as you can. When Absolutely as much as you can. You're doing 200% water changes a day, will not you? Yeah. yeah. Just no, on a regular basis. Yeah, I mean, I at the moment, I've got one tank running at the moment because I'm building a new fish house. Uh, so I've got rid of 
of many of my discus. Um, I still have some, still got my optums and, and that, but I've got them all in one tank in the old fish room, and they get water change every day. And I change, in a, in a, it's a 300 litre tank, and I change 200 litres a day, every day. The, the way it was first described to me, Paul, which I don't remember, is that if you don't use HMA, it's the equivalent of putting a human being in a, in a constantly smoke filled room. Constantly smoke Yeah. Yeah, it's a, that's it's a cracking gonna, way of looking at it. Which is going to affect your health. Oh, that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What, what he's, he's, he says is the equivalent of putting a human being in a smoke filled room if you don't use HMA. Yeah. Because the water, water, although you've used chemicals to make it safe, you haven't made it clean. Yeah. But it's, it's one of the biggest things that anyone could actually do is to improve your um, water change system so that when you do have a, a problem, when you will get a problem, that you've got enough there to be able to do a substantial water change. If, you can, it's, if, if you're running a fixed room, you should time and space is more warranted than buying some medication or anything else. Often time, totally agree. I've got a customer that he water changes when the water of the shower and the desk is thriving. Mm -hmm. No need to be. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. With it warm. And it's fresh as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it must be blessed with good water. <laughs> I mean, you must be. There's no smoke in this time. No. But, I mean, there's... Chlorines dissipate when you put it through a shower head. You must have yeah. smelled it coming off. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I... I I mean, in, in, certainly, in, certainly, where I live, you run the cold water tap, and you just just don't want to drink it. It's, it's you know. So when you put your clean water back into your tank, you're heating it first. Yes. So you're storing that in another tank. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you've got so that, that, you've got that, that to thirty that degrees ready to go in. Twenty-eight in my case. Yeah. Can I just ask as well, with the way you change water as well, because I mean, with my system, I link it from one tank to another and it just goes round straight down the way, so, so the water level never actually changes in my tank. Would I be better off taking some water out first, then refilling the tank, or does it matter if I do it on this loop, loop system? Does it matter? Um, because sometimes I find that my nitrates don't come down how I want to, and I have to then do another water change to get my nitrates to come down even more. It, it, there, there is, there is next, there, yes, it matters. Uh, let me explain why. If you are using continual drip, then as the clean water comes in, that's mixing with the old water, and ultimately a small portion of that clean water will go to waste. Yes. If people are particularly interested, I actually do have a mathematical formula at home which allows you to calculate how much water you're changing with a, with a continual drip system. Is that what you call that, is it? Yes. Yeah. If you're feeding clean water in, and it's, and it's overflowing to waste. That's called continual drip. Yeah, you take it. Right, okay. Or continual feed, if you prefer. Because yeah. sometimes it's a little bit more than a drip. <laughs> yeah, because that's what I do. I, I yeah. pump it from one tank into that one, and that pumps straight down the, the waste, if you see what I mean. From this, both, I try and do it from different ends of the tank, because yeah. I think that'll make a difference. But <laughs> uh, uh, Small ones, perhaps. Um, but there's, there's nothing wrong in continual flow systems. Right. Absolutely nothing wrong in them. Um, if you've got a healthy system, then using continual feed makes the job easier, mm. pure and simple. And if the fish remain healthy, <coughs> keep doing it. Keep doing it, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's not meant to be hard labour, mm. not meant to be endured, it's meant to be enjoyed. So if you, can, if you can run a continual feed system and it keeps the fish healthy, do so. When you're in a treatment, when you're managing a disease though, what you're wanting to do is to absolutely say, I know for a fact that this has happened. You want to take the, the doubt and the uncertainty out of the equation. One way of doing that is to empty the tank. Because you know you've removed all of the pathogens that were in that water. Yeah. You also know you've removed all of the chemicals or drugs that were in that water. One more question while we're on it. I've got an HMA. Mm -hmm. If I want to just trickle it directly into my tank at a very slow rate without heating it, yes, yeah, fine. That's normal. That's okay. Yeah, That's yeah. Normal. yeah. Pro provided, You've provided the, the tank temperature, the, the heating, the mm -hmm. tank yeah, temperature. You sometimes yeah. got to put a slightly bigger heat in there to, to yes. be able to cope with the yeah. temperature. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, if, I, if I run con continual feed, that's how I'd do it. I wouldn't heat it first. Mm. In fact, when I have run continual feed, that's exactly how I've done it. Cold water goes in the tank. Yeah, all run through, all run. I was just going to say, all run warm water through the HMA. Some people do that. Yeah, some people that, do that, but I, I, I don't worry about it that much. Why is there nothing on the market to let you know when the cartridges are done? There are. There is. The, 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 yeah. There's flow meters. You can actually get inline flow meters, which will every tell you how much water has been through. Every set of cartridges, if you go on the manufacturer's website, no. or wherever, yeah. Pentec or anything like that, will say this cartridge is effective for X amount of litres per minute for X amount of thousand litres. Yeah. So all you, you physically have got to do is have it prior to your thing. Is I bought myself an aftermarket water meter and just plug it into the plug uh, into the pipe work and what do you get? In line in line flow meters, you can get in line flow meters. Um, do you know what I do? Is I have a, a, a sticky label on the on the outside of the the thing and I put the date, I put the uh, cartridge in. Yeah. Mm. And then I go, oh, it's three months ago, stick a new one in. Yeah. Now, that, three, months is, three months is, is about right for the amount of water I use. It might be six months or a year for other people. Yeah. Depending yeah. on. Yeah. Point three about <coughs> the litres of water going through a filter, we've got that. But it's designed to remove chlorines and chlorides. It depends on the level of your tap water. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. If you have an HS oh, yeah, yeah. with 20,000 gallons, you'd actually put 40,000 gallons through it. Yeah, mm. because well, if, you, if you've got a low concentration... How do you know? Yeah. You, you, you don't get a lot. Take it yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. you will get... You, if you go on your water <coughs> company's <coughs> website... Yeah. But then it doesn't tell you about bonuses that they put in the water when there's a... Uh, when every time the, you've got a water main break, mm. they, you know, the, the guidelines are that they've got to stick in a litre of chloramine into, mm. the, into the thing, because it's a little bonus that goes down the line which kills any um, pathogens that might have uh, got in the drink water. Bang, away you go, and they put in 25 litres. Well, I mean, I work for the water industry, <laughs> and I've seen them standing chlorine pipes. Yeah. Mm. They, they batter it down. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, sort of, instead of sticking in a litre, they stick in 25. Yeah. It, it, from their point of view, they can't overdose it. From our point of view, mm. the, the yeah. consequences if you don't pick it up, and then it can be, be catastrophic. Are these filters more efficient on a slower rate than they are on a quicker rate? Yes. So the slower... The the, they, they're, if, they're efficient. Every <coughs> filter has a, a, a point at which the water goes through too quick for it to, to absorb yeah. everything. Yeah. Then it doesn't actually change their efficiency significantly by slowing it down too much. Because if you've removed it, you've removed it. And provided the water is exposed to the media long enough, most H most domestic HMAs, I think it's about four and a half litres a minute, I think, from memory. I don't run mine that quick because I just let it fill up for so long. Yeah, I'm very slow. Right, lights. Again, most people have lights over the tank and then often confusion as to whether you should use lights when you're managing disease. Generally speaking, I advise people just turn the fish tank lights off, leave the room lights on, just turn the fish tank lights on. There are some medicines which are affected by strong, I put strong lights in actual fact, oxytetracycline um, is affected by just ordinary fish tank lights. Um, if ever you've treated with it, you can sometimes see a yellowy brown scum develop and the water change to a yellowy brown colour. It means the oxytetracycline has actually gone toxic. So, you need to be aware of it. So, some treatments, if in doubt, are the likes of um, malachite green. Any of the dye-based medicines are affected by strong lights. It's just, a, it's just how they are. Um, also, when you're dealing with fish, it's like when we're sick. You know, um, if you, and those that saw me yesterday morning knew that bright light was causing me stress. You know, I have this horrible pathogen called a hangover, um, and fish are no different. If they're sick, bright lights can stress them. So we're trying to we're trying to create an environment where the stress levels are reduced. So turn the lights on. Leave the room lights on, though. Right? 
The bottom line explains why. Discus are not nocturnal. They need a period of daylight. They absolutely need it. Um, I don't know. I think Brian has a fish room with no lights in it. Uh, no Barry does. No, and I do. I don't know who else does. You, does yours have lights? Uh, external lights, I mean. Yeah. I've gone into my fish room and it is absolutely pitch black. Flip the lights on and all the discus look dead. Absolutely station. Because they're fast asleep. And pale, they look awful. You know? I've also got in, hit the lights, and they've all hit the tank of walls. So, <laughs> uh, you, you can win some, lose some. But the point is, discus need daylight. Right? They don't need bright daylight, they just need light. They need to have a photo period. So, leave the room lights on, turn the tank lights on. Reduce the stress levels for the animal. Obvious to, to some, but if you remember, one of the causes of disease was cross-contamination. Um, then it's it worth saying that if you going to have a, a disease and you're going to manage the disease and use separate equipment, uh, separate nets, separate hoses, separate buckets, separate towels. It's all very well going into your fish room, these separate nets, these separate hoses, doing the water change, then drying your hand on the towel, going to this this tank, doing it, then drying your hand on the towel, then going to So if you're managing disease, separate everything. But also, if you're doing your quarantine, barrier nursing as well, go and deal with do everything you need to, to do. Coming on to that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, gee, I'm it's the same one. thing. It's not your routine, isn't it? It is. As much physical separation as you can get. Right? Ideally, separate rooms. <laughs> now that's something I do agree with. Yeah. Um, it's only because I fart. If you can, if you've got a disease in your fish room, try and get an external air supply. People are often surprised by that one. And it's really, there's a lot of airborne pathogens. And if there, you've got a humid atmosphere in a fish room, warm, splashes, gets in the air, Air pump picks it up, circulates it to all the healthy tanks. Get your air pump outside if you can. Or in a separate room, somewhere else. Get a fresh air supply. And don't worry about it going outside in winter because the act of compressing the air heats it up. And my favourite one, a mop and bucket with some bleaching because nobody ever spills any water in a fish room, do they? <laughs> No, you don't spill it, you flood it. <laughs> <laughs> no. And again, the reason with bleach is, is, is obvious. If you've just done a change on a sick tank and you spill water on the floor, you just want to make sure it's clean. What about your pump taking any fumes of the bleach? I've never worried about it, to be honest. Um, and again, if it's outside, it won't be an issue. Um, my air pump's outside. I can tip bleach on the floor, neat bleach on the floor. It wouldn't be an issue for me. but. I wouldn't suggest that you get it such that you can't breathe in there through bleach fumes. But if you're bothered about bleach, use another cleaning chemical. It doesn't matter whether it's flash um, or even the um, commercially available veterinary products, use those. It doesn't matter. Just make sure you use something to clean the floor. Or a steam cleaner. Or a steam cleaner, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, steam cleaner would, would, would absolutely deal with any issues but it won't mop the water up. <laughs> and, and believe me, I've left plenty of water. That's what my husband's for. <laughs> <laughs> We're in essence getting to the sort of nitty gritty now. Um, this is a typical procedure for managing a disease situation. 
before you enter the fish room, make sure you, you washed and dried your hands. Salt water's fine. Deal with all your healthy animals first. Don't deal with the sick ones. Leave them alone. Go and deal with your healthy ones. Feed them, water change them, whatever it is, do it. After that, go and wash and dry your hands again. A number of times, I've gone, right, idiot. You know? So, you deal with your hospital tanks last. Even though you might be stressed and everything else, you've got to look after your healthy stock first. And when you finish with them, wash your hands again. So many, if you're only dealing with healthy tanks, it's less important. Um, and I'll be honest, when I'm in the fish room with multiple tanks and they're all healthy, I don't wash my hands between tanks. Hell, I use the same piece of bloody tissue to clean them. I don't care, they're healthy. They're all in the system, they're all getting the same water. I'd never ever do that with a disease tank, not intentionally anyway. So it's just stating the obvious so people know. This is a sort of blueprint, if you like, for. We're now getting to the stage where we've got to treat the fish. We've gone through all the procedures, we know what we're doing, analysed it all, we're actually going to treat them. And it's a step-by-step -step process to make sure that we do what we're meant to do and we don't miss anything. And the very first thing you do is perform a large water change, as large as you can. Now, this applies whether you are treating in the main tank or in the hospital tank. Wipe down the hard surfaces. Do as large a change as possible. Next thing you do is you remove any carbon, any nitrous oil, uh, any phosgen, anything like that, anything that's an absorptive resin will need it to remove it. Switch off your UVs if you're using them, switch off your ozone if you're using them. In my case, 99 times out of 100, I replace the biofiltration. If I'm treating in a hospital tank, you never had any to start with. If I'm treating in the main tank, I disconnect the filters. And I stick an air stone or a floss around the air stone. The floss is there to catch muck. And you'll be surprised at the amount of gunge that it collects. The next thing is once you've done all that, your tank's now ready to be treated. So accurately measure whatever it is you're treating with, whether it's a chemical or an antibiotic. Prepare it if necessary according to how it's meant to be prepared, so dissolve it if it's chloramine tea or potassium permanganate, crush it if it's a tablet, whatever, but get it ready. Apply the dose, cover the tank, switch the tank by itself. Important steps come when you have to redose. When you come to apply the second dose, and wipe the tank down and do a large water change. This does two things. One, it removes any surface-borne bacteria on the, on the glass, on the plastic pipe and heater. Uh, then by removing the water, you're taking all of that muck out of the system. And you're replacing it with clean water. When you are filling the tank, particularly with antibiotics, Apply the dosage as you fill the tank. Don't fill the tank and then put the medicine in. It's less important with things like chloramine tea, potassium permanganate, formalin and malachite green. In fact, it's almost unimportant with those. It's also not really that important with pressing quantel and flubendazole. But it is important with antibiotics. Um, Andrew Sol has done some experiments where he has demonstrated the speed for pathogens to adapt to antibiotics. And it's quite alarming when you read it. So, to stop them developing immunity, make sure that as you are filling the tank, you apply the medicine. 
for the very brief time that you will slightly overdose, it won't cause any harm to the fish. <coughs> right, we've covered much of this, but it's worth restating. The benefits of doing 100% water changes, or nearly 100% water changes, removes waterborne pathogens, pollutants, allows for accurate dosing. It's clean water, we know exactly what's in there. We don't have to work out how much we removed. We don't have to carry out any maths to say, I've removed, I think I've removed 80 litres, so that's, oh, how much of the dose is it? So it really removes error. It replaces trace elements. That may not be important if you're using HMA water from moderately hard and upwards. But if, you, if you're using RO water um, and using soft RO water, trace elements can get spent very quickly. The other thing is, is it rebalances the O2 because you have organisms living in the water using the O2, depleting it. So you're giving the, the fish what it needs and, and again reducing the stress. The stress of the water change is far less than the stress of crappy water. Of course, benefits of water changes are one thing, and also disadvantages of water changes. That's my current water bill. Mm. <laughs> Then you need to qualify that for a quite a period there. You were doing um, rather large water changes, weren't you? It can get away from you if you're not careful. <laughs> That's using RO. So, we've gone through the procedure, we've got our fish back to health. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief. What are we going to do? Leave a dirty fish tank in the fish room? can spread disease, or we've forgotten about and fill it with water, stick a healthy fish in there. No, we're not going to do that. As soon as you finish treatment, absolutely as soon as you finish treatment, thoroughly clean everything necessary. Throw the filter media away. Just make sure it's clean and dispose of any used medicines safely. Um, some can go down the waste. Most can't. Or be when we're doing a water change, how else are we gonna do it? Okay, I know I said it'd be non technical. Apologise for the next bit, but the whole purpose of what I've been trying to work towards with this talk is to create an environment in which the fish are less stressed. To create an environment in which the fish can effectively heal itself. So we reduce pathogen and we provide support if needed. In reality what we're doing is we are getting this, the circumstances back in the fish's favour. We're trying to get the fish back into a state where its own immune system can take over and make it healthy again. Because in reality that's what happens when we get treated. We get hit with a drug that knocks the bacteria back quickly and we're then given support so that we feel better and our immune system kicks in and gets everything back under control. So that's what we're trying to achieve with the fish. But perhaps it's worth knowing what the immune system, we talk about this all the time, but I wonder how many of us really know what the immune system is. There's two parts to it, to the immune system. Every living animal has an immune system. Heck, even plants have an immune system. The first part is called the innate immune system. And in the case of our fish, it's a skin and slime coat. And it's the barrier, it's the physical barrier. Um, and it consists of variety of things, but the inter some of the interesting ones are phagocytes and, and macrophages. And these are uh, organisms which live on the skin in the mucus and 
if a foreign body comes in, they attack it, literally attack it. They literally go to it and they engulf it and they eat it. They actually attack it. That's their job. The adaptive immune system works inside the body. And it's the, effectively the last line of defense. So in the cells and the guts and bloodstream. Um, and again, we've still got our friends, the, the, the macrophages there, but there's a few other difficult to pronounce words. Um, and it works in the same way. And it's the last line of defense. Now, when the immune system goes down, the fish stops producing these organisms. That's what it means. Now, a lot of these are produced from, I believe, bone marrow and the like, which is why people with bone marrow diseases are immune compromised. And the fish is not physically strong enough to actually produce these antibodies. What we're trying to do is create an environment where the fish feels better, take the stress off its other organs, so it comes out of emergency processing mode and starts to produce the organisms which you can fight the disease with. When the disease organisms become so great that they overwhelm that, that's when we have to step in. But until then, really what we should be doing is everything we can do to support their immune system. And that starts with reducing stress. So, basically, as you've probably worked out, what we're trying to do here when we're managing both our fish rooms and disease in the fish rooms is to reduce the stress on our fish. The only way we can do that is to provide as near optimum conditions as possible. Sometimes, when things go wrong, we have to step in to help the fish. Sometimes it's as simple as increasing water changes. Sometimes a little bit of assistance <coughs> with, with perhaps a little bit of acroflavin and salt or something like that. Sometimes it's more severe. But what we're doing is reducing the direct pressure and the stress on the animals so they can help themselves recover. As I say at the bottom, just using clean water, providing a quiet environment, will often be all that's needed. Any questions? How did you do all that? Because <laughs> he's clever. I've heard all this. Uh, the hard way. Yes. Um, donkeys, donkeys years ago, um, when I started keeping uh, expensive fish like discus, um, the internet didn't exist, not in its form that it is now. For those old enough to remember, there was, the, there was uh, things called bulletin boards like CompuServe and the like. Um, the various groups on bulletin boards were bizarre to say the least. Um, so the available information was, was incredibly hard to come by. A lot of the printed press and the available uh, books available to the hobbyist had misleading information in. And I'm probably guilty of killing more, more discus than most people have owned. Um, but you, you go through problems, you learn the hard way. I decided that I was either going to learn how to keep them properly and understand why they got ill, or I was going to give up. Because it was, it was silly not knowing. We're spending hundreds of pounds on these beautiful fish, and six months later, putting them in a dustbin. It seemed crazy. So I spent the time, I did the research, I bought, uh, I have a library of uh, reference works at home. Um, I've got more, most books by most um, acknowledged discus authors. Some of them are very good, some of them aren't. Um, but I have, I've, I've invested time in uh, learning how to use a microscope. Uh, I went to um, the veterinary college in Lancashire to do an evening class on how to prepare slides and, and use a microscope. Um, I, when we moved into the house we live in now, because the water was so variable, uh, because we're doing a lot of new building work, 
So they kept throwing tons of chlorine and alum and all sorts of other shit down the water. Um, I learned about water management uh, because it was the only way I could keep the fish alive. Um, through helping or trying to help other people on forums, I've had to learn more. Because sometimes you're looking at something and going, well, I've never encountered that. But most, most of the diseases I help people treat, my fish have had through my own incompetency sometimes. So through, through that, I felt that the best thing I can do is try and help other people. Because most of us in this room enjoy keeping distance. When they're healthy, it's great fun. When they're not, it's a pain in the backside. I personally want to see the hobby in the UK grow massively. I think it's grown immensely over the last few years. I'd love to see it grow more. People aren't going to keep these fish if you can't keep them alive. Mm. Hopefully what you've seen here today will show that with a considered, thoughtful, conservative approach that it's not expensive. The root, the root to this is to create a stress-free environment. The way we create a stress-free environment is essentially comes down to clean water, sensible temperatures, and don't worry about the peripheral things. pH is interesting, but largely unimportant. Your, your TDS of your water is interesting, but largely unimportant. It becomes important at the extremes, but then that's the case with anything. pH and TDS can be important if you're treating with certain medicines. Chloramine T springs to mind. Um, Oxytetracycline, I believe, is less effective at alkaline. Chloramine T is more toxic. Uh, lower. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I know. Um, and so there is some importance to it, but its relevance is low. If the debate is, I'm worried about changing water because my pH will change, then there is no debate, change the water, mm -hmm. put clean water in, and, and the pH will be what it will be. Do you think that um, we're going to get to a point where we're going to get a superbug come over from Malaysia because of the unregulated use of antibiotics over there? Um, I think there's a real risk. Um, I don't know whether it's specifically fair to when, yeah, from pick outside, on Malaysia. outside of the UK, uh, where it's outside of the UK, medication. there's, it, for example, there's, there's an unregulated use in the States um, of, of many medicines. They've found oxytetracycline at the bottom of the, the Pacific Ocean in the sediment there. Uh, there are many um, potent antibiotics and we can no longer use in the fish there. Chloramphenicol for what? Um, it's just it's just ineffective because fish have built resistance to it. Um, using antibiotics to treat anything should be a last line of, of, of resort. But yes, to answer the question, I believe there is a risk that there will be organisms that become immune to, to, to certain types of drink. There already are. Do you think there's doping in the growth of testing? Doping? Yes. Uh, do you mean hormones? Yes. Um, hormone usage is a very emotive subject for me. Um, some breeders use a tiny amount of hormones when they're when they produce with their young fish uh, to get an opinion on how their coloration and patterning will develop. Uh, the tolerances for, for hormone use within discus are very small. If you, if you get it wrong, the fish's life expectancy is low. Personally, I think it's abhorrent. I don't think you should ever use hormones on discus. We don't need to use them to get healthy discus. We don't need to use them to make them breed. They're not endangered. The only reason, the main reason most people, most commercial breeders use hormones is to get them to market quicker. 
sometimes those that are developing new strains do it knowing they're going to lose fish, but they need to see the, the effect of the crossings. So from that point of view, I can sort of see it, but personally I wouldn't do it. Um, it it's, it's, there's no need in my, my mind or opinion to use hormones in the general general day-to-day -day racing discus. But generally in the case with discus, the bigger the fish, the more money. Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. And I showed two years ago and the fish are even bigger again this year. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Um, the, the, the temptation for breeders to use growth enhancing hormones is there. But we've demonstrated, many of us as hobbyists have demonstrated quite clearly that with decent management routines and sensible feeding schedules, you achieve exactly the same end result. You might do it slightly slower from a commercial perspective, um, but the commercial guys, particularly the, the big discus farms in Malaysia and the like, they change a lot of water and they feed a lot of food. The vast majority don't use hormones anymore. Some do. There's still some in, in some countries that use hormones, but there's no there's no need and. The, the, the downside is that what happens is that they try and break into markets, for example in the UK or Europe or America, supply these wonderfully coloured fish which die within a few months. And ultimately they go out of business themselves, so it's self-defeating. Self-defeating. Um, there's often a bit of confusion um, between hormones and colour enhancing. Colour enhancement is natural. Many, many foodstuffs contain colour enhancers. Um, some beef heart suppliers put colour enhancers in the food. Um, they accentuate colours. Discus in the wild eat fruits and that which have colour enhancers in the um, uh, crustaceans and that which have colour enhancers in them. Flamingos do it's white and pink. Mm. Uh, so it's a natural thing. Overdosing them is dangerous, particularly the synthetic ones. <coughs> Any more questions? Well, you just use a bottle of um, food colouring, maybe? Just kick it and tip it with that. Is that it, Leave them, sir? Can we download this for the data or somewhere? Um, this gentleman's video. It will be on YouTube. <laughs> Any, any, any more? Yes, mate. Yeah, probably in the minority here, Paul. I don't use HMA, I just use apple say for example, accommodating units and so on and so on. I don't generally have any problems at all. I've only got the one tank. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the uh, apple say just binding heavy metals and so on, what are your thoughts on just adding carbon to assist with that? I don't use carbon. Um, the, the there's no doubt that carbon will absorb um, a variety of impurities in the water. So there's, there's, there's a benefit to it. The, the, one of the controversies with carbon is that um, certainly there's, there's still a lot of people on the various internet forum that believe using activated carbon filters in discus tanks leads to hole in the head disease. Um, I suppose if you were keeping your discus in incredibly soft water, you know, TDS of say 10 or less, then it might absorb enough of the trace elements to cause problems for the, for the discus dealing with its food and therefore lead to, to potential illness. I don't really buy into that as a, as a concept. I don't see the dangers in using carbon as such um, in, in that respect. I don't advocate using carbon because we change quite a lot of water. So you, you're often filtering clean water. So my, my objective is, is if you're changing that amount of water, save yourself some money. But if you're in a situation where um, you have more restrictions on you, then carbon, with certainly with most common water supplies, shouldn't cause any problems. 
Um, another commonly held misconception with carbon is that once it's absorbed everything, it'll dump it all back in the tank. Nah, not going to happen. But if you're, if you're adding a carbon to your filter for your tank or something like that, you might as well put the, the water through the carbon in the first place, won't you? Well, that, that's... It's, you, yeah. can get, you, can, you can buy it's, those little cheap inline carbon um, filters now, but you literally just got to have somewhere where you can plug it onto a tap I mean, outside, I appreciate run it for a small period of time, and then just take it away again, store it. I appreciate that not everybody can, can set up HMA systems and RO systems. And some people, it's just not practical. They just can't do it. They've got other pressures in the home life, which makes that makes that Children. impractical. So that's fine. Um, now, unfortunate. I've got a fish room. I can do what the hell I like in there, including flood it. Um, you know, that's, it's 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 fine. I don't have to worry about carpets or anything like that. Just get the mop out. He does it twice a bloody day sometimes. <laughs> oh shit, the RO! <laughs> yeah. 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 Do that it wouldn't happen. <laughs> if you've seen how fast his RO could jump all means use, by all means use carpets. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about the, the scare stories with it. Um, don't, certainly don't worry about it dumping what is absorbed back into the tank. That's not going to happen. All that happens when carbon has absorbed everything it can do is it becomes a biological filter. Um, and if you're really interested in why carbon can't do it, uh, carbon adsorbs, not absorbs. And basically that means it bonds at the ionic level. And the only way you can get the stuff out of it is to supply incredible amounts of energy or very, very strong acids, conditions which will never exist in a tank full of fish. Any more questions? Do your discus see your pH meter? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, my discus can't read books. <laughs> um, and, and we, we do sometimes get a bit caught up in, um, in what the book says we should be doing. Uh, my, my philosophy on this is don't. Um, do the common sense things, relax about it, try and enjoy them. Keep things as simple as possible. Whatever you're doing, if it's complicated, stop doing it. Simplify it. Give them clean water, sensible temperatures, proper filtration, decent food, as stress-free an environment as possible. They'll be happy and healthy. And hopefully, if you do that, you may never lose one. <laughs> any, any more questions? If not, thank you all very much for attending.